Welcome everybody to today's webinar, uh, COVID-19 Just Won't Go Away, Updates and New Insights in Patient Care. My name is Martha Alvarado. I am the Manager of uh, Education and Evaluation for MCN, and we have with us today our moderator, Amy Liebman, and our presenter, Laszlo Medeiros. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. Just wanted to let you know that we are providing simultaneous interpretation into Spanish for this presentation. So if you click on, excuse me, if you click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen, you can select the language that you want to hear. Likewise, if you click on the top of your screen where it says view options, you can select the PowerPoint presentation, either in English or Spanish that you want to view. And if you have any problems selecting your, your language of choice, just you can send an I am Cari Gonzalez and she will help you out with that. Next slide. A reminder that this presentation is accredited for continuing medical and nursing education. And if you do want to receive those continuing education hours, you will have to submit the evaluation at the end of this presentation. And I'm gonna go ahead and read our conflict of inter interest disclosure. We have no relevant financial relationships that relate to this presentation, nor do we have any relevant financial relationships with ineligible companies whose products or services are related to pertinent therapeutic areas. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and let Amy present the class. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Martha. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Laszlo Maderas, who's our Chief Medical Officer at the Migrant Clinicians Network. Um, not only does he work with Migrant Clinicians Network, but he has been caring for literally thousands of COVID patients um, in his other job, and one of his many other hats, as a hospitalist in central Pennsylvania. Um, Dr. Medeiros has uh, worked on um, infectious diseases and been interested in them since serving in the Peace Corps um, before he went to medical school. He also, in addition to working as a hospitalist in Pennsylvania and serving as MCN's chief medical officer, he also uh, takes care of patients with tuberculosis in Pennsylvania and also serves as faculty teaching medical students. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it to him. I will help with any questions and moderate your chat today. So welcome and give us lots of questions and enjoy the webinar. Okay, great. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Martha. Um, and I want to also thank our interpreters today. We will have simultaneous interpretation. So I'm going to try to speak slow, even though we have lots of things to cover. Um, so, you know, buenos dias, buenos dias, buenas tardes. I'm in uh, Pennsylvania right now. It is uh, just early afternoon on a very snowy day here. And I'm excited to be here with you guys. Now, um, I've been handling the, the uh, COVID situation with our hospitalist group since the very beginning of COVID here in South Central Pennsylvania. And I think the last count, we are well over 5,000 patients um, seen in the hospital not to mention many thousands more who never did have to go to the hospital um, because of vaccinations, other things we're gonna talk about now. And yes, it is still here. And unfortunately it is uh, surging this winter. And we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, how to help with various measures that we've talked about in the past, and then the medications that are there to quell the symptoms as early as possible, and also the importance of vaccinations. There we are, learning objectives, to discuss the state of COVID in the United States and explore strategies for the prevention and treatment of COVID-19 and identify resources to support the prevention and treatment of COVID in immigrant and migrant patients. And I always start my talks by saying today is January 23rd, 2024. And the information we're trying to give you at MCN is always the most up-to-date possible, but things may change. So people who listen to this in six months, things may have changed by then. So just be uh, be aware. We try to give you the best up-to-date information. And we have these uh, webinars frequently over the year to help that objective. Okay, next slide, please. 
So as we said, I'm, I'm from uh, South Central Pennsylvania, and currently the conditions of what we're seeing with COVID now is an increase in COVID incidents and increase in hospitalizations and also other viruses, including respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, influenza A and B, along with a bunch of other viruses, parainfluenza, metanumo, and others that we just used to lump together as the common cold, but now we're able to identify them more specifically as to what's uh, the actual infection. And the combination of these um, have been causing a lot of uh, hospitalizations in Pennsylvania across the United States. I'm going to turn my camera off here just to not have too much disturbance here. So what do we know? So right now, we don't have a lot of good data as to what kind of subvariant of COVID we're dealing with. Because right now we have um, mostly wastewater uh, information. The whole structure of our um, pandemic uh, public health system was dismantled over the last uh, year or so, especially after May of 2023 when funding stopped. So we don't have a great idea as to what variants we're seeing, except that the public health department and the CDC every once in a while gives us some information from across the country. But hospitalizations are rising in Pennsylvania. Um, I communicate with my fellow physicians across the country to see what's going on in their part of the United States. And it seems to be fairly similar in terms of COVID. A little bit of variation in terms of influenza, but pretty much the same as what we're seeing with COVID. So more patients are being admitted to the hospital, um, but they're not dying of COVID. So overall, there is less severe infection, and um, but patients are staying longer uh, because uh, they have other comorbidities. And sometimes they have not just one virus, but two and even three viruses at the same time. Um, again, fewer hospitalizations and deaths compared to the previous waves. You can see there in this slide, the first wave, the alpha wave was, was pretty big and wide. Um, the second one was Delta. And then the huge one, the third one that went sky high is uh, Omicron. And after that, we've had the BAA variants and now the J1s, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Well, I'll so, interrupt you for one second. Sure. The interpreters are asking if you could please turn your camera back on because it helps them to see you. Oh, okay. All right. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Les. I was thinking that might be. Okay. Am I, you guys reading my lips then? Yes, they are. Right. <laughs> Thank Excellent. you, Les. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. All right. I hope I'm not going too fast here. So what I'm trying to cover here is that these different waves, um, there were some bigger ones in the past with more deaths. Uh, now there's fewer deaths, but the uh, infections are keeping people debilitated. And one, one of those reasons is because it affects the elderly disproportionately. And so they end up staying with us in the hospital for longer and longer periods of time. Okay. So it is still a leading cause of death. And I believe the last uh, word since uh, the holidays in December is that about 200 to 220 deaths per day in the United States due to COVID. So that's still pretty serious. Although again, it's much less as you can see from this curve than in the first years of this pandemic. Next slide. So looking at weekly emergency department visits by age group and respiratory illnesses as a percent of all emergency department visits. Again, we have limited data. This is just what comes into the ER. A lot of people test at home, stay at home. They don't report, you know, what their um, situation is and if they're positive for COVID or sick with some other viral infection. But hospitals are strained due to COVID and other respiratory illnesses because most of the ones who are sick enough to come to the emergency room probably get admitted. That's at least our experience in our part of Pennsylvania. And once they are um, in the hospital, they are debilitated most of the time, just being in bed for a few days and being 75 years and older or 65 years plus. Um, a lot of times they get deconditioned and have other comorbidities and cannot go home. So the hospitals are strained due to large numbers of patients who are staying a little bit longer. And also our hospital systems, are, um, our workers, many people have retired and many people have left due to getting sick themselves. So our staff, 
are limited, but the numbers of COVID, you know, are rising. Although looking at other years, the influenza and uh, RSV rates are not that much different than they were in years before COVID ever arrived on the scene. But our hospital staff is diminished again. So, and we see similar trends internationally. I was looking at a webinar recently that reported on data in Danish children and uh, uh, patients in the Netherlands and uh, in Poland as well. So there's there's a lot of similar trends going across. So it's not only in the United States, but in other countries where you know data is being gathered. So we're seeing this now here, the 65 and older and the years um, from birth to one are the highest if you if you look at that uh, in the last few uh, months. So basically the very young and the very old are the most vulnerable that uh, come to the emergency room with viral respiratory illnesses and most often will stay at least a day or two. Okay, next slide. So this is the weekly ER visits um, for the viruses. And you can see there that over the last few weeks, um, the combined uh, viral infections of one, two, or even three of those viruses together was the, was the highest uh, visits that we had seen. And we also have second place influenza, mostly influenza A, although we're now starting to see influenza B, and then RSV down, down below. So it's important to know that you know now we have a way to do a viral panel in the emergency room that detects for up to 12, 13 different viruses. And uh, so if it's not RSV, it could be influenza or COVID. But if it's both or all three, they all light up. All three can light up. So that's how we have that evidence from the ER visits. But again, we don't have much from homes. And there's not a whole lot that we have been able to report from our state or the country because the whole public health system again has been dismantled recently so we are kind of blind to what's happening uh, elsewhere except for some of the national uh, epidemiological reports that we get from various trusted resources okay next slide so currently the offshoot of one of the omicrons the b a uh, 2.86 as a descendant here, the JN1, and that has become the dominant variant. So if, as we get new dominant variants, these tend to foreshadow increases in the cases that we see. And that I saw, I showed you on the first slide, Alpha, Omicron, Delta, each one of those as they came out as new uh, variants, uh, there was a surge in cases subsequently. Um, now, these have a higher chance of being immune evasive also because they have slightly altered their uh, protein uh, surface and also because people have stopped getting vaccinated. And so six months, a year later, um, they have uh, less immunity than they had when they first got vaccinated or had the last variant and got sick with it. So about two weeks ago, the JN1 variant was 38.8%. And then just more recently, two weeks later, our last data here as of one eleven twenty four, is that 61% of the COVID cases are JN1 variant. Um, so that's the most recent data that we do have. Okay, next. So why should we be concerned? Well, because of hospitalization and death. And again, the most Vulnerable populations are very young and are very old. And those who get the um, COVID infection are more likely to get long COVID, much less so if you've been vaccinated against COVID. But unfortunately, we have a poor vaccination uptake with the most recent uh, updated vaccine. In fact, only about 20% of adults have been given the updated vaccine. Although I think we just got some more information here, hot off the press, that now um, about 41% of the uh, 65 and over have been vaccinated against COVID. But of those, 37% are in nursing homes and nursing home residents have not had much um, over 
63% have not been uh, vaccinated against COVID. And 10% or less than 10% of the care providers at nursing facilities have the updated vaccine. Whereas if you look at the UK at this point, again, this is just hot off the press, 70% of the 65-year-olds have been vaccinated there with uh, COVID compared to 41% for us. And I think that since those are the most vulnerable populations, they tend to come to the emergency room when they're sick, they tend to be hospitalized, and they tend to stay longer. So this is one of the concerns that we have uh, regarding all the... Um, hospitalizations for the elderly and also of the very young. So many of them do try to get vaccinated. I want to give credit to some of my patients in South Central Pennsylvania who've been looking around at various pharmacies, especially with the RSV vaccine. Very hard to find. Influenza is easier to find. But um, since, again, we had the whole healthcare system for COVID dismantled in May of 2023, now some pharmacies have the vaccine available for COVID and not all of them do, or they run out very quickly. So there has been an attempt in my patient population to get vaccinated, but often the supply is not meeting the demand. Um, and also I'd like to see more uh, clinicians recommend the vaccine. And I see that sometimes that that is also a challenge. Although most of my colleagues are working very hard to convince our patient population to please get vaccinated. And we have now the vaccine for RSV, we have vaccine for influenza, and we have it for COVID. So, you know, it's it's really important to try the best to get all three and uh, survive these uh, viral infections. Next slide. Okay, so reasons for low rate of vaccination rates. Again, poor distribution across the United States. Um, previously, both in the Trump administration and the Biden administration, we had the uh, warp speed um, program that uh, was creating the uh, vaccine itself and then distributing it across the United States and all the US territories. And it was pretty amazing how it was actually successful in distributing as much as possible. There were still discrepancies and vulnerable populations didn't all get you know, same access. And we at MCN were working with those vulnerable populations, the ones that uh, would benefit from getting the vaccine, but didn't have the means to get there. Um, the other reasons for low vaccination rates, uh, misinformation and sometimes disinformation. And we have been working also at MCN to try to get the correct information out to you as quickly as possible any changes that come in, but a lot of times there was a misinformation on the vaccines themselves. So now we don't have, um, unfortunately, the, the, um, the politics of vaccinations were really tarnished the um, trust in trusted leaders. And so we have been also trying to work with other trusted leaders who would help the uh, population get the vaccination information that they need so that they would be able to uh, be protected. But there's a lack of trust right now that is really difficult to uh, reestablish. And I think that I do worry about that in future pandemics um, because we try to get the best information, but there's often uh, no trust in the um, public health officials. So these are some of the reasons for low vaccination rates. Next slide. Okay, who is the most vulnerable? Again, the elderly, 65 and older, um, people with comorbidities. So my patients who have been long-term smokers who be, live on supplemental oxygen, two to three liters a minute of supplemental oxygen or have COPD or pulmonary fibrosis, some things that make their lungs more vulnerable to the assault from viruses that are respiratory viruses. And the, again, these are the patients of mine who tend to stay in the hospital longer because they can have the viral infection leading to a bacterial pneumonia, leading to either hypoxic or low oxygen situations, which leave them debilitated and deconditioned after 10 to 14 days in the hospital. And from going from being at home, they go to a nursing facility or extended care facility because the viruses hit them so hard. Uh, 
and also the immunocompromised. So patients of mine who have had transplants, organ transplants, and their physician gives them immunosuppressive medication so they don't reject their transplanted organ, or patients with HIV who are uncontrolled and have AIDS, for example. These are all uh, conditions which make the patients much more vulnerable to uh, get the viral infection. And these are the ones we really want the, the vaccine to be given if possible. Uh, that would give them an added protection which they might otherwise not have and leave them very vulnerable to long-term hospitalization, long COVID and death. Okay, next slide. So the elderly, again, are the most vulnerable. So here is COVID-19 monthly deaths per 100,000 population by age in the United States. This goes from January 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic when we realized it had come to the United States all the way till the end of this past year. And again, you see the first wave, the alpha wave, then the delta wave, and then the Omicron was especially brutal to um, the elderly. And you can see that the purple line, the highest line there is the one that is 75 years and older. So you can see that that, that is the most significant death rate that we had um, over all the, all the different uh, variants that caused the pandemic to flare up at times. And you can see now, again, my, my point here is, again, that the 75 plus uh, are still the most vulnerable, although we're nowhere near the death rate that we had in previous uh, variants. Although, again, 200 per day is still not acceptable. I don't think that we should, you know, settle for that. I think we can do much better. So this is, the, this is what we see as the elderly being the most vulnerable um, over the past four years now. Next slide. One other thing I want to mention before I do that is the um, the death rate is 18 per 100,000 in the 75 and older, and it's 0 0.1 per 100,000 patients in the under 40 age group. So you can see a, a huge difference. It's logarithmic how much more the um, the elderly are vulnerable if they get sick with uh, COVID. So now we go on to prevention. What can we do? So luckily, we still have the vaccines that are effective. So both the Pfizer and uh, Moderna vaccines, the mRNA vaccines have been updated and they do handle the new variant JN1. That's great news. We also have the Novavax, which is a protein based uh, vaccine. Uh, which has some fewer side effects overall, but all of them are effective and all of them are better than not getting vaccinated. So again, this is, um, this is great news that the updated vaccine is effective against all these new variants. So at this point, whatever is available in your pharmacy is okay to get. Uh, earlier, we used to say that we try to get the same family. So if you got Pfizer's before, then please get the Pfizer again if you can. But we realize now that it doesn't make that much difference, that if only Moderna is available and Pfizer is not, or Novavax is available and you used to take Moderna, you can get whichever one is available. Um, they're monovalent at this point. We used to have the bivalent previous years, but those are gone now. And, and these are structured to attack the newest variants. So all of them are good to... Uh, if you can get it, get it. Don't wait for the one that you had before. All right, next slide. Dr. Les, can I ask a, a clarifying question before you, sure, before sure. you move on, on to that? Yep. Um, so I, I think you're going to say it on this slide. Never mind. I was going to ask about um, effectiveness um, of okay, illness yep. versus... versus um, yeah. So, yeah, the updated vaccines are effective in minimizing severe illness, hospitalization, and death. They do not prevent you from getting COVID. None of the vaccines so far have, have been able to do that completely, but this is very similar to the flu vaccine in that, you know, many times the, you get the flu shot and you still get flu later on. Um, so hopefully it'll 
prevents you from being hospitalized. But even if you're hospitalized, again, I use this from my own experience, even with my hospitalist patients, very few of them that have been vaccinated had to go to the intensive care unit, get intubation and ventilation or die. Most of them have, have spent some time in the hospital, depending on their age and other debilities, and uh, went home successfully. So this is, again, very different than 2020, 2021, all the way till last summer. I think last summer we started to see the effect of either enough people have been vaccinated or the variants have has become more infectious but less lethal or people have uh, experienced several you know infections with the different variants and so right now thankfully we don't have as many deaths. Again, the flip side of that is you know 200 per day is still too many deaths. So Again, this updated vaccine is effective with a JN1 variant. It lowers the risk of long COVID. And the vaccines tend to wane after six to eight months. So we should stay up to date with any new vaccines that come along. I think that is going to be really important too. Your immune system will build up antibodies and it will work for a while, but it doesn't stay um, as long as we had hoped in the past that it would go for years and years, but every every six to eight months, it would be good to look at the, uh, the new situation and see if we need new, you know, new variant vaccine. Okay, next slide. So MCN has various vaccine resources. Resource one, who can get the updated COVID vaccine? And you can see detailed information there. Also, uh, there's frequently asked questions that we have on our website, and I try to update that with all the expertise that we have, um, and we do that in both English and Spanish. We're going to try to do it in various other languages as well, and uh, I work with our chief editor to keep updating those frequently asked questions, so you can either read them or you can see uh, short videos of them. Another resource is what to expect when getting the COVID-19 vaccine, and that's that's in this uh, resource here as well. Okay, another thing that we can do besides vaccinations is masking. I know this is a really hard ask because people are just very tired of using masks over years and years. Uh, we in our hospital are masking all the time when we go to the emergency room. Some hospitals are now masking all the time with all healthcare workers again. Uh, so depending on what part of the country you're in, uh, you might see masks being mandatory for all healthcare staff. And uh, I always t take one in whenever it has a respiratory illness. And I have a long history of wearing masks. And then last summer, I have this one story, I'll make it short, but I did not see many COVID patients for a while in August. And uh, at the end of August, I had a couple of patients who were just tired, but they were very they were elderly, they had been vaccinated, and they just felt a little bit sore, sore in their back and their shoulders because they were gardening. And I thought that that was just dehydration and just working too much in the garden. But the next day they developed a fever and then I checked them and they had COVID. And uh, guess what? A couple of days later, I had COVID. And so early September, I, I unfortunately had to miss a very uh, important uh, meeting at MCN that I couldn't attend because I had COVID and I did not wear a mask that day for that particular patient thinking that it was probably not COVID. So we can't tell sometimes ahead of time that somebody you know, has COVID or just getting the sniffles and it turns out a day or two later, yep, they had COVID. And I wish I'd worn my, my N95 respirator. They're still the best protection against uh, getting the virus and as we saw in 2020, 21, as we were, before we had vaccinations and as we were getting the vaccines, that as we use these N95s and used a lot of personal protective equipment, uh, most of our healthcare providers, including me, did not have any influenza, RSV, or even any colds during that time. Even though we were working really hard to keep our COVID patients alive, we were always wearing the respirators and so most of us did not have any other virus uh, infections either. And that was one of the benefits that, you know, looking back at it, 
uh, no matter which virus you're talking about, the N95 respirator is a very good protection. It's one of the best things that we have. Again, it can't be for everybody, and I don't expect people now to just go around and wearing masks all the time again. But consider your risk and the risks of others who are vulnerable. So if you're visiting uh, one of your loved ones in the nursing facility, please wear one. I always wear one when I visit my elderly parents, uh, especially if I had just come off a shift where I'd seen a whole bunch of uh, patients with viral illnesses. Also, make sure that you consider the risks of what what area you're going into. If it's indoors, it's a crowded space, uh, it has no ventilation or very little ventilation, and how much time you're going to spend there. Because each one of those incrementally adds to the risk of getting a, a viral infection. So just make sure that if you um, are sick or feel like you're getting sick, or you're going to a patient or a family member or loved one who is potentially at risk, like I said, elderly, immunocompromised, or have other comorbidities, uh, I think just for their sake, it would be good to have the, uh, the uh, N95 to protect them and to protect you. Okay. Next is ventilation. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about the ventilation. So if we can have um, outdoor spaces, much better than indoor crowded situations. Um, and ventilation does make a difference. So to reduce risk, you know, outdoor is better than indoor and a shorter time is better than a longer time. So, yeah, again, the one of the things I, I had mentioned to some of my staff here as we went into the uh, Thanksgiving and the other holidays in November to December is that we're getting together with uh, closed spaces. Just be careful of all of these things. And even then, we did have in our hospital an uptake in hospitalizations just after Thanksgiving. And we're seeing some of the, the, uh, the post-New uh, Year's uh, increase in hospitalizations again in the hospital at this point. I can't say for sure. It's an association, some kind of correlation, but not necessarily. But I've seen that often enough that I, I, I'm making that conjecture right now. That was because people did get together and many of them told us that they got together. Um, you know, they don't want to spend more time away from their loved ones. So they all got together and inside, it was very cold here in Pennsylvania and everybody stayed inside. And uh, now we're seeing the results of that in some further hospitalizations. But there's risks in, in everything that we do. And I think it just be best to be as prudent as possible to reduce your risks. You won't eliminate them entirely. And, and sometimes like me, you know, you just bad luck. You wander to one patient's room. You don't think they're sick at all and they, you can get COVID. Okay. Next slide. So again, we have these materials protecting ourselves and others with respirators and masks. And we have these in uh, Spanish and in English. Um, so these are, these are things that uh, you can look at more closely on our website. The um, NRC RIM uh, showing ventilation as an essential control strategy to avoid contagion. So these are all available on our website. So I'm going to summarize the testing part of it here. So testing is still important. Test before gatherings would be great. And you can test even if you think you don't have uh, COVID, but just a cold. It could still be COVID. It could be early COVID. Or again, it could be one of these other viruses. And if you do feel sick, but test negative for COVID, we have a plan here for you also. And if you have difficulties accessing COVID tests, we're going to show you a, a site, a government site, where that would be made available. And um, I think you can get, at, at this point, up to eight test kits per family or maybe per individual. I'm not sure, Amy, if um, which one it is, but um, we are still uh, able to access testing kits um, at this time. And we'll show you the website for that as well. Okay. So next slide here. Dr. Laz, it, it, it's, it's for per family and it, it kind of, it's going to vary um, depending yeah. on if you've ordered them or, or for per address. And it's going to vary on whether or not 
you've ordered them in in the past but we'll put that link up uh great yeah soon so yeah. you can see how to get it yeah i wasn't quite sure about all of that so very good thank you okay so the timeline for vaccinated and unvaccinated people so if you were exposed and you know that you were exposed at day zero for the next 10 days, it would be best to wear a respirator like an N95, one of the different uh, uh, respirators that uh, block small viruses. And then at that point, if you have no symptoms, you can take a COVID test at home, continue to wear a respirator. And if you still test negative at day five, you can go to day 10, continue to wear a respirator. And if you are negative at day 10, you no longer need to wear a respirator and you're probably out of the woods at day 10. Now, if you test positive, you should isolate. You know, here we are back at day five. You tested positive, isolate immediately. You do have COVID at this time. And then the question is, you know, how serious is it? How much of a risk are you to progress to getting sicker? So the next couple of days, okay, you're wearing a respirator. But if you notice that you're getting short of breath, if you're just very weak, uh, then this is the time to call your provider and let them know because there's other things and we'll just talk about that here in the next few minutes that we can do to minimize your risk of it developing into fulminant COVID with you know, lack of oxygen we call hypoxia that um, you may have problems with um, you know, breathing enough that you will need to be hospitalized. So if you develop symptoms, you isolate, get tested immediately for testing and isolation information, see the CDC's COVID calculator or ask your healthcare provider what you should do. And there you have the um, the calculator also for risk, what to do when you're exposed. So again, this is this is the the way to uh, get uh, checked, and this is valid for vaccinated and unvaccinated people. And again, as a anecdotal, um, well, it's anecdotal. After five thousand patients in our hospital, the vaccinated tend to do much much better than the unvaccinated. That's just very generally true for us. And I think it's true across the nation and probably globally. The vaccinated do much better. Even if they test positive here at day five, uh, they rarely develop the rest of the symptoms as badly as those who are completely unvaccinated. All right, next slide. So where to order the COVID-19 test kits? The free COVID-19 test kits by visiting covidtest.gov. For assistance um, in more than 150 languages, there's your phone number for that. And each household can receive eight rapid antigen tests. See, I just should have waited till that slide came up. Yes. So it's the household can receive eight rapid antigen testing. Um, again, I think as Amy had said, this may vary across the nation for availability. I can't say. I, I know that it is available in Pennsylvania, and part of my work at the State Health Department in Pennsylvania is to make these available to our Pennsylvania uh, patients, especially those who are, for example, T TB positive. Because again, comorbidities like diabetes, TB, HIV, will put you in that higher risk category. So as I treat my patients for pulmonary disease, I want to make sure that they have these uh, rapid antigen tests available in their home as well. But again, this may vary from location to location. Okay. Next slide. So now we talk about prevention. Now, what about treatment once you get uh, COVID? So once again, populations who are at risk, older, that's age 50 and older. So I'm in that category here now. Uh, and the most vulnerable are even older, 65 and older, and then 75 and older. So there's there's augmented risk, but let's just say at age 50, you know, you are now more at risk. Then those people I mentioned who have respiratory issues like asthma, COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, these lung diseases put people much more vulnerable. They have less resistance, less resilience um, in their in their lungs to fight, you know, a, a viral infection as well as having pulmonary disease. And a lot of them will get bacterial pneumonias on top of that. Other populations at risk, those with cancer and on cancer treatments. Uh, sometimes the cancer treatments will reduce your white cells. And those are the army that fights off disease. 
So some of the cancer treatments we give will also make you more vulnerable to infection, including viral infection. Chronic kidney disease and liver disease make it difficult to have your doctor give you the full range of medications that they could otherwise give you for uh, these illnesses. And they also just put you at, at more risk again for and more of a um, immune system that is not working as well as people who don't have these comorbidities. Diabetes also, obesity, body mass index over 35, are these are all risk factors for um, getting uh, sicker with the viral infections. Many heart conditions, and again, the immunocompromised patients who have either uh, an organ transplant or HIV or take other, one of the things I didn't mention is things like rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune disorders where your physician will give you immunosuppressive medication to prevent things like rheumatoid arthritis from attacking your joints. Your autoimmune system is suppressed so that it will leave your joints alone. But there you go then, and you now are getting other viral infections or exacerbation of tuberculosis. So these are some of the populations at risk for um, having hospitalization and uh, needing uh, medications to prevent a full-blown uh, COVID attack. Next slide. Okay, so <clears throat> therapeutic management of non-hospitalized adults with COVID-19. So here are some preferred therapies in order of preference by the NIH COVID-19 treatment guideline. So one of the things that we've had now for several years, and it's been a winner for so many years, and it's still outlasted many other things like convalescent plasma, which you don't use anymore, but uh, nirmatrivir with ritonavir boost combination. This is a pill, it's a 100 milligram tablet that you take twice a day for five days. And this is for people who are not hospitalized yet in general and are not hypoxic, which means that they don't have any low oxygen and that um, you've discovered their illness in five, sometimes up to seven days, but mostly up to five days. That's an oral medication. The next one is remdesivir. And this one is very good for people who are already hypoxic. We start this, we can do that in the outpatient setting if there's an IV infusion area that you can give them for three days. It's 200 milligrams for the first day, 100 milligrams for the next two days. And if they're hospitalized, that makes my job easier because I can monitor them for the next five days sometimes. So remdesivir can be given for three days or up to five days. And these are the more serious, more sickly people who may need uh, high flow oxygen later on. We've used remdesivir now also for the last four years. So again, these are these can be outpatient, but remdesivir is becoming more, uh, well, it was more inpatient, but now there's, um, with infusion services and all that, there's some outpatient uh, places where they put this on for three days. Um, once, once um, yeah, anyway, so that's the remdesivir, and we're gonna go on to alternative therapies uh, for when the um, other medications would be preferred. Because remdesivir has some other challenges for people who are on behavioral health medications, uh, anticoagulant medications like Apixaban, um, Eliquis, Xarelto, et cetera. These all have to be stopped while you're on the Paxlovid. Now, the other things with Paxlovid is that you can there's certain medications that you can stop in, in um, while you're taking Paxlovid, such as cholesterol-lowering medicines, the statins. It's good to not use Paxlovid with statins, but you can easily stop the statins for the five days or so that you're using Paxlovid and then restart that with no harm to the patient. But the, uh, the behavioral medications are more of a challenge. And so this uh, other medication that we often use, the Molnupiravir, like Arviro, is the other option, which has fewer drug-to-drug uh, -drug side effects, but it's not available at times. Um, it's harder to find in some places, including my area of Pennsylvania. So this is an alternate therapy uh, when the Paxlovid is not appropriate or the remdesivir can't be given because it's IV. The um, molnupiravir is given 800 milligrams twice a day, also for five days, and it's oral and it can be taken at home. So those are the those are the basic weapons that we have right now. Yes, Amy. 
Yeah. Dr. Hoss, I, I want to interrupt you. We, we are getting some really great questions that I think are important to answer in addition to some of the content that you have left. So I would suggest that you could try to wrap it up and then we could get to some of these great questions that are coming okay. in. Okay. All right. Very good. I'm trying to go fast and also slow so that our interpreters get a chance to, you know. All right. Thank you. Um, so tools for drug interactions. So here are... Um, this is the site that I have used and actually really in, enjoy because there's so many different drug-to-drug uh, -drug interactions that uh, we can have, and many of our patients are on 10, 12, 15 different medications. So this is an NIH government site that uh, can compare certain different uh, medications and uh, see what you know what goes with what and what is absolutely or relatively contraindicated with these medications. Okay, uh, next slide. So clinical considerations for antiviral treatments, interactions with other medications. I try to briefly go over that a little bit. It does leave a bitter metallic taste in the mouth. Um, and that is one of the most common side effects of Paxlovid. Sometimes it can give you some GI symptoms, loose stools. Uh, there's also this COVID rebound that happens often eight to or two to eight days after the initial recovery and it has recurrence of symptoms or a new positive test after you test negative. If you're in rebound, you still can be infectious to other people. So just keep that in mind. Now, the literature reads 20% rebound using Paxlovid. So one in five people do have a rebound, but most of them tell me that, you know, they much rather have that than to not take Paxlovid and bear the full brunt of COVID. And if you get the full brunt of COVID, the more serious infection is, the more likely it is that you're going to have the complications of long COVID at some point in your future. So you're reducing the res risk, and I think it's still worth the benefits um, of using Paxlovid. Often it is very mild, but the patient, again, can be infectious, and they could be really disappointed that, you know, they're back, they're back into the rebound and they're still sick. Usually the, the rebound is not as bad as the first uh, the first initial uh, infection, but you have people telling different um, stories there also because it's very individualized. But again, it does prevent the worst of the infection. It often will prevent you from needing to go be hospitalized, and it can prevent the long COVID uh, effects later on in your life. Next slide. So clinical considerations for antiviral treatments, Paxlovid renal dosing is available for people with moderate renal impairment. If you have kidney disease, your doctor might uh, modify the recommendations for dosing. It's not recommended for people with severe kidney and liver impairment. And Paxlovid reactions to medications for depression and mood disorder can be challenging because it's only five days and some of these medications, you can't really stop cold turkey and um, they can have problems of their own if you try to do that. But if you try to taper off, you'll have already gone past your five days. So that is a tricky situation for some people with certain mood disorder, antidepressant medications. Next slide. So the treatments again with the Paxlovid, who is it for adults uh, age 12 and older? Start as soon as possible, but begin within five days of when symptoms start. Again, some physicians have started to use seven days, not just five days but generally the recommendation has been five. Taken at home by mouth twice a day. So that's a 100 milligram tablet twice a day for five days. The remdesivir is for adults and children, start as soon as possible, but begin within seven days of when treatments start. Again, as I mentioned, this is intravenous and it can be given at a healthcare facility where there's an infusion service for three consecutive days. If you're sick enough that you have to go to the hospital, we'll continue that on for five days and continue the the dose that was started outpatient, and uh, they can be continued inpatient. Uh, again, and then molnupiravir is start as soon as possible also after knowing that you're infected. Begin five days, just like Paxil Paxlovid, taken at home by mouth, 800 milligrams twice a day, five days, very similar to Paxlovid. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here are some of the other information that we have for uh, MCN's resource hub, and you can look at that on our website as well. And I think, Amy, I can turn it over to you again at this point. Is that the questions? Sure. 
Yeah, so, we, have, we have a lot of again. questions. Yep. Very good. And um, I just wanted to reiterate that the next couple of slides are some of the resources that MCN has available. Go to our website, check out our hub. We are constantly, even in January of 2024, we are putting up-to-date relevant resources on there. Uh, so now I wanna turn to some of the questions. And Laz, there are several and let, let's time them. The first one, answer really quickly, but I think it's a really important one, is in your experience, you recommend that, that the vaccine continue to be applied to people who have already more than three COVID-19 vaccines. Yes, yes, unfortunately. At the beginning of this uh, in 2021, as we first started getting a vaccine, we weren't sure if this was gonna behave like a tetanus vaccine, which is good for 10 years, or whether it's gonna be a, a vaccine kind of like um, MMR, which we need you know, three times in your life, or if it's gonna be like flu, which is every year. And so it's behaving unfortunately more like flu. Although again, I don't believe there's a, a seasonality of this right now, it's still kind of working itself out. But as we get the newer variants, unfortunately, the, the, the vaccine I think is gonna be needed to be updated. So it's behaving a little bit more like the flu that changes you know, yearly. And so I can say, well, I got my flu shot back in 2019. Do I need another one now? Why, why would I need that? Well, just because of our experience in this, this kind of thing. So it is going to be, unfortunately, something that we have to keep up with. Um, and maybe as, as we get more used to this virus, it may be less and less lethal. I'm hoping that's the trend right now, but it can still make you sick. And if you don't get the vaccination and you get COVID, the long COVID situation may be, you know, one of those things that you will suffer more heavily with than if you got the vaccine and kept updated. But good question. Yeah, it is frustrating. I can read between the lines here. This is Amy. And thank you so much again, Les, for answering that question. And on the screen is uh, just a reminder uh, that we have a bilingual blog that's a frequently asked question. Dr. Laz and staff at MCN work really hard to update it. And there's a few updates uh, there'll be an updated one coming out very soon. And uh, uh, Noel, if you wouldn't mind putting the link in the chat for that particular uh, resource. Uh, and that's why I wanted to uh, have you answer that first question because the second question, there's two questions. The, the first question that I would like for you to answer is there's still a little bit of confusion. Roxana is asking, once you get COVID, and this is the age-old question, it's a good one, but when can you go back to work? Um, and are you able to uh, respond to her? When, when you can go back to work, yeah. Yeah, so I, I'd wait. If you had COVID, I wouldn't go back to work before 10 days. Now, if you're still sick at that time, then you should retest and, and see. Hopefully, you will turn negative. Now, if you wear a mask, in some settings, like us in the hospital, we go back to work at 10 days and we just continue wearing a mask. If we're asymptomatic, we're not coughing, and we're feeling well enough to do our work, we, we do go back to work at that time. Hopefully you'll test negative at that time, but some people will still carry and, and still test positive after 10 days. Um, again, it kind of depends too on what kind of work you do. And do you work with other people? Are you the bus driver in the school? Are you working by yourself at home on a computer. So the answer to those kind of vary as according to you know, what your kind of job is as well. But if you're no longer sick and coughing, um, or if, you're, if you're var your variant causes you more diarrhea, GI upset than anything else, you know, I'd still wear a mask, but I would just kind of, you know, hand precautions, washing and, and social distancing as much as possible. If your job allows that, that's great. If not, then wait a little bit longer. We're still kind of working that part out too, because these other variants, you know, they may change how strong they are, how long they last, and how infectious they are. Again, I, if you get COVID rebound, then test again and um, stay away from other people because you're still infectious at that point. Yeah. So the, there was a couple of questions on that, and so. 
One is, I think you gave a great answer, Dr. Laz, thank you so much. Um, but also, I want to encourage folks to go to the MCN Hub. There's some resources to help out with that. And I think it's a, a challenge, and I think um, while I'm not reading Roxana's mind, uh, I think one of the challenges is for folks that are don't have the paid sick leave um, and are in a position of putting food on the table, trying to balance uh, not infecting others while um, earning a living. And I think some of the resources that we have will help with that decision making. Um, so the next question, which is gonna take just a little bit of time, uh, and I think we got so many of those questions that Martha, it might be a wonderful topic, uh, not a wonderful, Thing to have a good, a good topic for MCN to be discussing. And that is folks would like a little bit of an update on what you know about long COVID. Okay, yeah, we had one of those um, webinars also with uh, Dr. Kata Whitegardner also. So yes, long COVID, usually about three months after you have had COVID, if you still have some kind of symptoms or they resolve and they something comes back again, fatigue, brain fog, um, joint aches. Um, we, we had noticed that some people get coagulopathies, which means their blood is a little stickier. And so they get certain things that they wouldn't otherwise have gotten, such as clots in their leg or clots in their heart or heart attacks or um, clots in their brain with strokes. So coagulopathies and, and um, these kind of things can happen after COVID. Uh, so a lot of people that I send out from the hospital, I send home with some aspirin to begin with. And it used to be that we put them on anticoagulants for a while, like Eliquis or Xarelto, for fear that they may have those kind of complications, especially if they already had heart attacks in the past. Again, it has to be more specific to different patients, but long COVID is a whole umbrella of symptoms that affect um, different parts of the body and it is a longer question than I can answer here. I can, I can give, you give me another hour and put up the slides that we have for long COVID and I can go over all of that. But basically it does, it affects many different organs. Um, it is giving us some insight now into other things like a chronic fatigue syndrome, like fibromyalgia, because there's similar mechanisms or people um, sometimes behave in the same manner that they have when, with these uh, other um diseases. And so we're, we're learning a whole lot more. And I think as time goes on, we'll, we'll learn you know, even more about long COVID. And it's been four years, so we do have some data here. But um, it is still kind of a one of these things that the constellation of potential symptoms, and do we relate it back to long COVID, or there's something else that's going on? Um, the brain fog, we've had you know, concerns about, especially years, for early years when we intubated patients, and kept them on a ventilator for two weeks. And then they got better from their COVID, but they had this brain fog. And then we weren't sure, was that just because they were intubated for two weeks and then they woke up? Or was there something else going on? Now we know that there's an individual, that's a one thing, one case, but there's another situation where they didn't ever get that sick and they still have the brain fog that makes them more debilitated. And there's a whole other aspect thank of that, that, yeah, that, that we talked yeah, about. Thank you, thank you. I just, I just I'm going to cut you off for a moment because there's one more question that you can close out the session with. I think what we'll do is we'll answer some of these questions um, in response. We're also going to refer you to the FAQ, the frequently asked questions, because a lot of the questions that you're asking, the answers can be found in there and it's offered in English and Spanish. And while Dr. Laz answers the last question, I really encourage you to complete the evaluation. Um, for those getting continuing education, you have to do the evaluation. And those who are not, we need to hear from you to see how we can improve. Um, so the, the last question is, um, someone is asking about what to do. Um, she's uh, calling in from Paraguay, but in that case, it's very hot. People are indoors and the air condition is being used, cases are increasing, what do you recommend? Yeah, so I, I don't know if, if, when people are together in both hot climates and cold climates, yeah, if you can isolate as much as possible, I don't know if somebody's, somebody's sick already, 
they should be tested if possible. I don't know if there's testing available at that point, but if there is testing, isolation, as much hand washing as possible. And then if, if people are together in, you know, in one room, I know that's really a hard, that's a very difficult situation as we have also said about our, our migrant population who work, you know, from trailers, there's like six people in a trailer. It's really hard to then isolate. So depending on the ability to isolate, try to isolate if you can wear masks, wash hands. Um, and if you can get the vaccines, that is, that is wonderful. My concern with places like Paraguay, and I get, I get, I don't know if this is a city or a rural area, but many parts of Latin America that I worked in uh, over the years, in the last four years, you know, they don't have hospitals that have oxygen. And one of the things that that we give in the hospital is high flow oxygen to people, and that's a really important thing too. Besides Paxlovid, Remdesivir, etc., if you don't have access to even a small amount of oxygen, that's a real challenge. In, in parts of the world that um, you know have difficulties with certain supplies. So I don't know if that's satisfying, but I, I will yeah. answer questions online as well. These are all great questions. Um, I wanna thank you all for uh, listening in. I try to balance going fast and finishing on time with going slow and helping our interpreters. And thank you so much to our interpreters. You guys are wonderful. I know it's a hard job to keep up with all the terminology, um, but thank you so much to all the uh, interpreters as well and for um martha putting this all together and amy thank you very much for your uh guidance here and to keep me moving along thank you to Great. everyone it was a whole behind the scenes thank you so much i just want to say one quick thing before we close um well, again thank you to our interpreters to laz and amy and also i'll be i'll be sending everybody a follow-up email later today with the links to all these resources including links to both the english and spanish uh, recordings and evaluations. So thank you everyone.